Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And uh, this week uh, was a marine, this is a marine mammal highlight, and uh, it was between the Heavysides dolphin and the Fraser's dolphin. And contrary to last week's landslide, or last marine mammal highlights, <laughs> landslide of a victory, this one squeaked out by one vote. So if you voted for Heavyside, it might have been your vote that put them over the top. So... Good job. <laughs> and if you didn't, don't worry, because that means that we will have the Fraser's dolphin back in our poll at some point. Yes, exactly. Both very cool. Uh, but yes, the heavy sides won out uh, this time. So this was an interesting one. Um, they're kind of isolated in a way and far away. And um, it's we know some stuff. We don't know some stuff. And some stuff is confusing. So <laughs> they're, they're a mixed bag of species but very beautiful looking so they are gorgeous yeah, yeah. so let's start off Kat will do that with uh, what they look like and uh, where they're at right now yeah so let's talk first about about where these guys are found because you mentioned that they are a little bit isolated so heavy sides dolphins are pretty much only found in the coastal waters off the southwest coast of africa so we're talking from northern namibia to basically the south of cape province um, so this is like a range of about 2,000-ish kilometers. Like it's really not a huge range. It's like 2,000 to 2,500 kilometers, I think, is their is their coastal range. That's super interesting because when I talk about their their um, home range size, it, the, the, I put a pin in that. That's interesting. <laughs> Okay. So, and I found a couple different things with that, where some people were saying their range is like 1500 kilometers and then other ones were saying it's like 2000 to 2500. Well, so yeah, mine was like, they have relatively small, they have small home ranges, 876 square kilometers to 1990 square kilometers. And I'm like, that's small. I, I personally wouldn't put that as small and especially not small if their range is 2000 kilometers. <laughs> seems like that's basically like they could go but, anywhere within their range right like yeah so okay this is where i think we're already getting into a little bit of where this is saying right so this is the thing so their mm -hmm. range is limited to this 2000 is you know ish around 2000 kilometer coastline area while they're not considered necessarily rare within this they're not evenly distributed within that range so this is the thing and this is probably where it's getting into like we don't really know what their actual home ranges are. Like we could, they could go, we know it's not over the entirety of their range necessarily that they do seem to like specific spots within that. Mm -hmm. But how much do they range within that? Sounds like we don't really have a great handle on that. We do have some new research Ooh. that may shed some light on that. Still confusing, but. <laughs> okay. All right. So basically complete. like stay tuned for more on this. All yeah, right. As we so go, as we get into detail. Still, I'd say 876 square kilometers is not a small home range to me. Well, I mean, I really square don't... kilometers are different than kilometers, though. So. Yeah, but still, like, yeah, I mean, small home range, I'm saying, in like, you know, 30, 40 kilometers. True, like, true. You know? Right. So, oh, I guess right. it just depends on what you mean by small. Yes, exactly. So, within this slightly confusing range, um, <laughs> The, the distribution of these animals is likely, at least to some degree, limited by currents, right? So they prefer temperate, cool waters. So I know that I found one reference that was saying that in um, in Angola, for example, their range seems to be limited to the Benguela current because that area has more of that temperate, cool water. Um, and so this really seems to be one of the main drivers for where these guys are found. In general, they inhabit mostly the coastal waters, usually at depths of less than 100 meters, um, and they seem to prefer sandy shores exposed to swell, which I thought was a very specific thing it's to say. Um, which, I mean, that was so, like, fascinating. Why specifically in a certain spot, because it has to have that specific habitat. Yeah, and again, if you're thinking about the waters around southern Africa, sharks are a big threat in this mm. area, right? So predation, also uh, killer whales are in this area as well. So again, this might be, if you can see underneath you with that sandy shore, 
maybe that's helpful. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm sure Cindy will get into this a little bit more, but just to kind of, again, put a pin in this, um, some studies indicate that they do seem to inhabit the same area year round. Um, migratory patterns are not super well known. Um, there was one individual that was satellite tagged that traveled 158 kilometers north of where he was tagged. So, you know, that's kind of a one of the ones they're going off of, but I'm really curious to hear more about the new research that we have with their, their distribution and range. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what they look like, these guys are fairly small as dolphins go. So they're about uh, five and a half to about five foot six feet um, in length. They're, you know, about the size of a harbor porpoise, which I, I think say, is really interesting. Very yeah. Very similar. Dorsal fin also is a little Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So they are about five and a half feet. They weigh between about 130 to 155 pounds. So again, this is very similar size to a harbor porpoise. They are kind of a blunt head as well. So they don't have a big extended rostrum. So they actually kind of almost look more like a porpoise because they really don't have that elongated rostrum that we would expect with a dolphin species. Mm -hmm. Um they have rounded what they call paddle shaped flippers and um their dorsal fin is more uh, more triangular than um a lot of other dolphin species. So a lot of dolphin species have that more curved, what we call falcate dorsal fin. This one is a little bit more triangular. Again, more um, like more, it definitely looks more like a porpoise, which is fascinating. And um, I'm going to talk about vocalizations, also more porpoise-like. Ooh, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think these are like the hybrid between the two dolphin and porpoise species. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's so, in, and they are cephal cephalorhynchus um, species, which is really interesting. So or genus, I guess. Um, so in terms of coloration, they are very striking in their coloration, very distinctive. So it's really hard, especially given where they live, to confuse these guys with really any other species in this area. So the head, dorsal fin, flippers, tail, and back portion of the back of the animal are all like a darker gray. The The front part of the animal is a lighter gray with it has a nice dark eye patch around each eye. And the, the belly or the underside is white. And then there are also flashes of white on the flank right below the dorsal fin. Um, and it was really interesting. I found a, a spot where they were talking about a white patch on the um, that extends between the pec fins on the chest of the animal. Um, and in males, this white patch ends in a point. Well, in females, this white patch widens out to cover the mammary slits. So if you see the underside of the animal, you can actually tell if it's male or female by the coloration. So that's very similar to orcas, where they have the it's, different yep. coloration patterns there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Really interesting. So yeah, if you're not watching this on YouTube, definitely go Google a picture of these guys because they are beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, very, very distinctive coloration. Um, again, especially given their size and... and and what else lives around here it's really very unlikely that you would confuse this with anything else yeah i saw that too they're like confused with not anybody else because yeah looks like <laughs> there. really except, nothing except for baby orcas they did say that because of that yeah that's what i was gonna say yeah coloration, you know. mm -hmm. yeah because that color can look black depending on you know what lighting you're seeing it in and like how far away you are mm -hmm. um but again given given the 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 size, I mean, I guess you yeah, might people, five and a half feet. It might be people think dolls, porpoise, or baby orcas exactly. too up here. I so I guess it's for people say, look at the orca and it's a porpoise. So yeah, like, like a harbor porpoise. <laughs> so yeah, if, you know, if you're not if you're not in the know of dolphin and porpoise species, it could be um, could be confusing. Could be confused, yeah. But if you're in the southern areas of Africa, you're probably seeing a heavy sized dolphin yeah. if it's about this size and it has this kind of black and white and gray coloration. The the white on the side that comes up, like the it, it like the white comes up and it does this like curve up into the body. And to me it looks like somebody, you know, you take putty and you're like pulling the putty out like this. Oh, like silly you know, like, putty kind of? Yeah, like silly putty. Yeah. It looks like Oh, it's cool. That's fun. Too. So it's like Yeah. Yeah. yeah That's know, a fun visual. Just what I thought of. I yeah. have lots of fun visuals in my brain that <laughs> may or may not make sense to anybody else, but <laughs> that's what makes naming animals so fun. Mm -hmm. exactly. So yeah, that's what I have for where they live and what they look like. Pretty, pretty clear cut with these guys. Yeah, no, for sure. Like I said, they're clear cut is a good way to, to define what they look like too. It's, it's very striking differences yep. in the color. Clean lines. There's no like, there's no like modeled color into this. It's like, mm -hmm. that's, that's the next color. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so um, for diet, I don't. I have 
two basically two things um one the one thing that is is consistent across all the, the things that i looked at is that they love hank oh interesting so, okay so hank is their their go-to but they eat uh kingfish gobies plus octopus and squid like they do so they eat a lot of different things I could not find the actual study. This was this referenced, but it, one website had that in a study of 17 dolphins, they found a total of 4,928 different food items. Oh my gosh. Like Among 17 animals? Yeah, from 17 animals. Wow. So hmm. as I said, I couldn't I couldn't find the actual paper. So who, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but hopefully, you know, it's a reputable website. So I'm assuming they're correct, but um they maybe are more opportunistic than we think but for the most part everybody's just like yeah they love hake hmm, okay a few other species so that's their main thing and they even think that their movements are likely related to the movements of, of hake which would make sense again if they're small and they can't maintain a ton of body mass they would need to be foraging a lot more frequently so if they're you know, their prey would be driving their their movement and behavior i would guess a lot kind of like porpoises mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. another thing like porpoises uh, that i'll talk about um a little bit more in the new research particularly but they do have um narrow band high frequency vocalizations mm -hmm. so very similar again to porpoises uh, those high frequencies that's let like dolphins dolphin species have high frequency but not in the same way that porpoises do like porpoises are basically exclusive pretty much exclusively narrow band high frequency um and these guys are kind of again they're kind of in the middle um and i'll leave that for the new research but for the most part when they're foraging they're using that narrow band high frequency likely to avoid predators like killer whales right mm -hmm. if they're talking as such a high pitch that the dolphins the, the orcas can't hear them that's much safer for them mm -hmm. But um, I'll look again a pin in that to talk about it in the new research a little bit later. Um, so uh, the and what's interesting is the the when we were talking about the home ranges, um, they said most along shore movements were less than eighty eight kilometers, and this is through photo ID. So they actually okay. used photo ID to to do that that study. Cool. Yeah. Um, so the generally the consensus is that they're in small groups of less than ten, usually pairs and trios are the most common. I can. Like purposes, right? Um, often in tight groups, but the, but these guys are intensely social, mm. so that's a little bit different than what we know of for purposes, right? We're still learning about their um, associations, but not they're not like dolphins, where it's larger groups and they're obviously hanging out. Um, but so they're intensely social. But then I have another study that says the associ association patterns are fission fusion, like dolphin species, but have basically random mixing. So there's it, there's not it's not non random oh. associations. So hmm. to me, I I guess it it doesn't have to be counter you know whatever like usually highly social. I think of highly differentiated societies, right? Their relationships and their social with those individuals. But I suppose you can be social just with everybody, you know, random. Yeah. Even if it's random, you're just mm -hmm. like, hey, you're cool. I like you. Let's hang out. Um, yeah. So interesting. I think we still don't really fully understand it. Um, the range is limited, like you said, to those less than 100 meter depths. Um, and that's, again, also fairly similar to harbor porpoises because they are, uh, they like to be in a bit more shallow area. Um, they, but contrary to harbor porpoises and other porpoise species, um, these guys are very active and sometimes boisterous. I just love that. That was a quote from one of the love that word. books. Yeah. Boisterous, known to bow ride and wake surf, so they're not shy around boats. Um, they'll even do uh, ride the waves of uh, breaking waves that are close to shore. Um, they are quick and agile, often zooming around vessels and repeatedly leaping out of the water. So, oh, that'd be so cool to see. I know, right? Especially their coloration. Oh my god. Yeah, it'd be so, beautiful. Just beautiful. So, um, so okay, so they're quick and agile, often zooming. But then another one says that the rounded appendages and chunky body indicate that they are not particularly fast swimmers. But then Which I heard I no guess, one was fast swimmers, so. I guess if you're doing like little bursts of speed, that's different than like, yeah. you're, you know, you're, you're going at speed for a long time or like a doll's porpoise that can travel up to like 50 miles an hour, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So, and that could be, I mean, if you think about oceanic dolphins that are very slender and, you know, there's, they're hydrodynamic, right? And these guys yeah. are so because of blood. 
but they can still move quickly when they want to. Kind of like manatees. <laughs> manatees are not known for their speed, but they can move pretty quickly <laughs> when they want to for short, short movements. Um, so they, their movements again are usually based on that, on their primary prey, which is hake, um, which, uh, and then they rest in the near shore waters during the day and forage at night, mostly on hake. So again, also, I mean, porpoises, uh, eat all the time, but they generally have, have peaks in the evening and the nighttime, um, for that as well. So, um, so my last thing for the behavior is that the genetics show, and this isn't necessarily behavior, but, um, talking about the, the, the group, the population size. The genetics show that it's likely one population, but more research is needed. And this was from a 2002 study with a small sample size. And I'm gonna put a pin in that because there's new research on that genetics that shows something that's not the same, right? And it's the so we're gonna get more into that. So we, they think it's one population, but new stuff is, is happening, showing something different. So okay. I'll leave you guessing for that. Um, so my favorite section here is reproduction <laughs> because this is very confusing. Basically, the most of the ones that I've looked at, um, they go, we have no idea. We have no idea. We have no information about the reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, that we did, there was one that said some calves are born in the southern summer, which makes sense. So November to January, summer. June, some, mm -hmm. southern hemisphere. That was in the um, uh, the marine mammals book, which I uh, uh, is a very very good and reliable source. Um, but then this other uh, from the whale and dolphin conservation, because um, it was actually hard to find some um, references for just the, these guys in, in general. Like there's just not that much out there. But they said that they're sexually mature between five to nine, pregnant for ten to eleven months, and give birth every two to three years. It's but, very specific. It's very specific. And everybody else is like, we have no idea. So I don't know who's right. Interesting. And I couldn't, there was no reference as to where they got that information from. Mm, so I okay. couldn't check the source. So I tend to go with, we have no idea. But that's the 10 to 11 months and give birth every two to three years. That's pretty common across corpus and dolphin species. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly dolphins for the longer interbirth interval. Um, and so, the the later at, at sexual maturity too, like that's more like like other dolphin species um, correct. typically are more sexually mature later. But they said I the only the I only this is the only place that I found for life expectancy, and they said twenty to twenty three years. This is on the the whale and dolphin conservation yeah. society. Did you have a life expectancy anywhere? I did not. Uh -uh. Okay, so that's the only place oh. I found anything, and so that is counterintuitive because it, that's half the life of or less than half the life of normal dolphin species. So if you have the late sexual maturity and a longer interbirth interval, but without that extra life expectancy, like you you hmm. cut your life expectancy in half, but you keep the that, you're you're gonna be have a real hard time keeping your population if anything happens to it, right? Yeah. Because it's gonna be hard. You're not you're just not gonna have enough time to replace the population if you're in danger. So hmm. um so anyway, so yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Um, so I have no idea whether the information is correct or not. But the overall is like, we basically kind of really don't know. So <laughs> if anybody listening knows anything about heavy sides, dolphins or active research happening in this area of Africa on heavy sides, let us know. Because I think we're very intrigued by yes. what is actually going on with these guys. And none of the new research has anything about reproduction. So <laughs> I mean, it's one of the hardest things to study in wild species. So like, I get it. But at the same time, it's interesting since they are coastal that you don't, they don't have more visual on yeah. Well, you know, tracking and the they animals. Do, they, there's that study did photo ID. So like you would think they would at least know like, hey, we tend to see the calves at this right. point in time, you know, which is where they yeah. did have that for the southern summer. But, you know, hmm. it's it's interesting that there's no further information. Yeah. Even from like okay. stranded individuals, maybe they just don't strand or I don't I don't know. So hmm. reproduction is confusing. Um, but I think we don't know a lot. I think that's probably the best way to go. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be very interesting if that is true. If they yes, have absolutely. And they still have that. That's very, um, very interesting. And actually, that kind of links back to the menopause episode we just did with mm -hmm. the workers um, of how, you know, how that do you extend the life expectancy, but keep the reproduction the same or vice versa um, as to whether menopause would evolve. So if you're interested in female reproduction, go check out the menopause episode. <laughs> Good luck.
Um, but that's, uh, I'm going to leave you with that um, confusing end to reproduction that, that we just don't know. Uh, very similar to much of the other things we have here. But um, with that, we will take a quick break and be back with the, um, the abundance, estimates, and threats, and the intriguing new research. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. So let's talk about um, more heavy sides, threats, and abundance, right? Yes. Yeah. So let's talk what about we, status. What we know. What we know. Um, <laughs> which again, like the rest of this episode, it's kind of a mixed bag. So they are... Heavy sides are listed by the IUCN as near threatened. So what this means is that they don't qualify for being critically endangered or endangered or vulnerable right now. Those are the other kind of bins that they can be uh, grouped into, but they are close to qualifying or are likely to qualify for a threatened category in the near future. A lot of this comes from not having a good idea of their overall population numbers and knowing that they have a very limited range. So basically, the, because we don't know a lot, we're not quite sure how under threat they are. Um, your your face tells me you have a question. Yes, I do have a question. Because yes. so, did, so you looked up the current IUCN list. So yeah. what's interesting is I have a quote from the paper from one of the papers I was reading that's talking about the first abundance estimates, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. um, that was in 2020. And they mm -hmm. said that the IUCN Red List Global Species Assessment was revised from data deficient to near threatened, partly due to remaining uncertainty regarding the overall population structure, abundance, and anthropogenic threats. Yeah, so that's the, okay. the current listing is near threatened. Is near threatened, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, basically, I yeah, I was just, sure. yeah, I was just explaining like what that means. So near yes. threatened basically is like, we know enough to know that they could be under threat, but we don't know enough to know if they actually are threatened. So we're going to place them in this kind of like hedging sort of they could be threatened and we we want to make sure that they are ready to move into a, a truly threatened category if we know more. Which but right nice now we're not sure. That like, yeah, hey, we don't know enough, and but we know enough yeah. to know that they could be in trouble. Right. So, and I guess that's the, that's the difference with data deficient, which we've done many species on here that are data deficient. That is literally like, we don't, we don't know. We don't have a good enough idea of how many animals might be present worldwide to even have a, have an idea of whether they're threatened or not. Well, I mean, we don't even know how quickly they reproduce for gosh sakes. Like, that, exactly. That's and that's, I think that's right. All of this that we're talking about, all of this uncertainty flows into making that categorization distinction where it's like okay we know that because they have this very limited home range um if anything happened to them they would immediately be under threat yeah. however we don't know what level of threat they're actually under right now so near threatened they are listed as near threatened <laughs> so do and do you have what they what they're what they're classified in from south africa specifically um i do not oh okay so because this was from that paper as well because it was abundant okay so i'm gonna say it here since it makes sense um, what's interesting is so the IUCN is like it's near threatened because of all these things. The um, was the, the conservation status in Africa, South Africa, was recently updated from data deficient to least concern within South Africa, as they mm -hmm. appear to be locally abundant in the southern part of the range. So it's right. like now you have this larger group saying, "Hey, we don't know enough," but then the one that's right there going, eh, "That's okay." So that could pose some issues, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's where again, when I said at the top that they're not considered rare, yeah, in their range, right? They're not. They're they're uh they're not evenly distributed across their range, but they're not considered rare within their range. So again, it's a kind of a gray area with these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, we don't have overall population estimates. However, some abund abundance estimates from photo ID studies are available. So, for example, a three-year study between Cape Town and Lambert's Bay, South Africa, estimated that 527 animals were using 20 kilometers of coastline over a six-week survey effort. Um, 3,429 animals were using 150 kilometers of coastline around St. Helena Bay, which is again within this same study area, and that was over three summer seasons. And 6,345 animals were using the full 390 kilometer coastline from Table Bay to Lambert's Bay. Um, and that was over the full three years. So basically over the course of three years, they found that like around 6,000 animals were using the entirety of that coastline. Interesting. What, 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 do you know what paper that was? Um, I forget it's in the, it's in the overall, um, sources that I had, but I forget exactly which paper. 
because I have um, one. I think that was that was from the IUCN website. Oh, interesting. Because yeah, the I have the first abundance estimates in that with that one paper, and I don't know if I should say it now or or in the new research. I'm just saying now. So, yeah, since we're talking um, about so it. So these guys. So this Martin at all 2020. These are the first abundance estimates for the species currently. Um, they used combined visual and acoustic double platform survey configuration. Um, to use to investigate factors affecting the detectability of heavy sides and also duskies. Um, and the average base annual baseline density and abundance estimates for heavy sides in the uh, NIMPA region, um, the, the, the marine protected area. Um, Namib I always say the, that word. Wrong. Namibia. Namibia, thank you. Um, between 2012 and 2014 were. 0 0.08 individuals per square kilometer and 1,594 individuals. Right, but that's a different location. Right. So what I was just talking about is from South Africa. Right. Well, so from Nam from yeah. Namibia, which is a different country, they're talking about the the 1,000 ish, right? Oh, see, I keep so that's what I'm saying. So they have they have these specific studies that are done in one part of their range. We're not talking mm -hmm. about the entirety of the range here. Interesting. Um, so yeah, so this is a thing. So again, they're patchy within this overall distribution. They are they are kind of specific to these density patches, it seems mm -hmm. like anyway. Right. Um, so it sounds like in Namibia, we're talking around about what, 1,000, 1,500 animals? Yeah, about, yeah, about close to 1,600. Yeah, and they said, okay. and they also said relatively small population with a patchy distribution along the coastline, right? So very, mm -hmm. yeah, consistent. Right. And so in that in that South Africa area, again, using that 300, 390 kilometers of coastline from Table Bay to Lambert's Bay, they as they found about 6,345 animals that had been over the three year study. Right. So well, again, this, is this isn't talking about like this is like overall number of animals, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, it's it's a little confusing, right? Where it yeah. seems like they have these these denser patches, but how many animals specifically are using these patches? We don't fully know. Right. Um but again, this is where it gets into confusing of saying, well, they're they're locally abundant. Well, that might be true, but if if Which that's <laughs> right, and if you're saying the local abundance is high, but the overall population range, that local abundance makes up ninety percent of their entire population. Right, that's a different picture. So again, this is where it gets a little bit like, yes, we're getting very granular here, but we don't fully know how each of these feeds into the overall population picture. Yeah, and and uh, this, this one from the and Namibia is is the, you know the first one first abundance estimates for that area and that was in 2020. So yeah. we don't have a lot of long term data on exactly is that is that high is that low is that average is what what has it been? Um, yeah. And I'd also like to put an asterisk here is that geography is not my thing. So I <laughs> definitely do not know like you were saying those names I'm like I don't know what those are. And I think most of the studies that I did for the new research have all been in that area that Namibia. Um, okay. Area, so that's why I was like, "Wait a minute, that's different than what I have." And like, oh, because you're talking about a different place. That makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think all of this, just before we get into the threats, all of this just really highlights that yes, these guys are coastal, but also when we're talking about doing research in countries like Africa, there's a lot less funding, yeah. um, and it can be a lot more challenging. And I'll get into this a little bit in the threats. Um, there's a lot of a lot of this part of their a lot of their range actually has very low population density on land. So yeah. there's not a ton of people that are observing these guys from land and throughout their range. So there's a lot of different factors that kind of go into why we don't know quite as much about these animals. Yeah. Um, and it can be harder to conduct research, especially long-term funded research in, in these parts of the world because other things just take preference. Yeah. So with that being said, let's get into their threats. And it's not quite as bleak of a picture as for some species we do, which is awesome. Always love when I don't have a really depressing one. Um, so again, like I just said, these guys are considered slightly less at risk than some other species because of that low population density of humans in their range and the lack of large ports along the coastline within their range. So there's less um, anthropogenic effects directly impacting them. However, there are still some. So let's get into it. Mm -hmm. Number one is entanglement. So again, as you might expect, given that these guys are coastal, their proximity to shore and smaller size does make them a lot more susceptible to entanglement in inshore fishing gear. So things like beach seines, purse seines, trawls, gill nets, et cetera. Just like um, and Exactly, exactly. So this is this is a huge issue for porpoises, especially in places like Europe, right? And, and the UK where, um, you know, some of these larger trawl fisheries are 
very susceptible to bycatching porpoise. So again, because of that small size and where they're located and likely what they're feeding on, if there are hake fisheries in the area, they're they're going to interact with it with fishing gear. Mm -hmm. Although bycatch in commercial fisheries does seem to be fairly low, um, there is a, specifically a midwater trawl fishery for horse mackerel, apparently operating off of South Africa's west coast. And that one was specifically noted as a fishery of concern. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if they've had larger bycatch rate and rates in that specific fishery, perhaps, but that is one they are watching, I think, to to see how impactful that is on the on the species. In terms of active hunting, they are protected from commercial hunts. However, again, their proximity to the shore does make them vulnerable to being caught by harpoons or guns by human consumption. So the heavy sides dolphins are protected within a 322 kilometer exclusive fishery zone or EFZ off the coast of South Africa and within a 20 kilometer EFZ off the coast of Namibia. So basically you can't, you can't harm these animals in those in those protected areas um but again this sounds like it's just more of a kind of an opportunistic or perhaps even fishermen who are like hey you were taking my fish get out of here you know shooting at them things like that um another one which was interesting was construction um and offshore mining so the impacts of marine mining um, and notably sediment dredging for phosphates um the impacts on the marine environment aren't really that well understood but this this basically means direct destruction of the seabed and the benthic fauna. This also is potentially releasing hazardous materials into the ocean. Um, and there are quite a few proposed uh, onshore processing plants as well in Namibia, um, which are in or near known high use areas for heavy sides dolphins. Um, and specifically at a couple of different ports in that area um, where the dolphins are known to frequent. So this sounds like it's kind of an evolving threat. We're not quite sure how this might impact the animals, but it's likely to have a pretty pretty big impact. And again, because there's less people presence, this would seem on the surface of it like a great place to do this because you're not disturbing people. Mm -hmm. But these animals are exclusively using this area. That's a big deal for them. Um, we already talked a little bit about predation. So again, in this area, really their main threats are going to be from orcas and from shark species. Um, again, we don't have good numbers on how many animals per year are taken due to predation, but that is that is always a threat for them. Um, and then the last one is climate change. So again, because of the limited temperature range that is occupied by these guys, and they seem to really prefer that Benguela, what, what the, the Benguela current ecosystem, uh, which is a cold water system, which is then surrounded by the warmer waters, right? So you have this colder water current flowing and then you have the warmer Water. tropical waters around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, heavy sized dolphins have been identified as one of the cetacean species that are most at risk from large changes of global climate change um, because so they are so closely associated. That, yeah, yeah they're so closely water, associated right? with that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if that starts to go away or change, that could have massive impacts on um, again, direct and indirect impacts, you know, reducing foraging, um, increasing illness or susceptibility to illness, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I do have a couple of fun facts, but I'll save those till the end. Okay. Um, cause I, I'm impatient and I want to hear about the new research. <laughs> <laughs> there is some cool stuff, right? So we already talked about one thing, so that's, it reduces how much we got going uh, through here, but this other stuff is actually pretty cool too. Um, I, again, I wish there was more in reproduction, but alas, there's, there's nothing. Um, so we're going to go back to vocalization. So remember that they have that um, uh, narrowband high frequency, which is likely for to be cryptic so that they can talk about foraging and finding food without announcing to the orcas where they are um, to, so for them to be there. So this is by Martin et al. 2018, and um, it's uh, about acoustic relaxing of, of the acoustic crypsis for increased communication. Yes. Ooh, cool title. I know, right? Um, so the heavy sized dolphins are they, they were thought to exclusively produce those narrowband frequencies, uh, echolocation clicks with a centroid, I always like that word, centroid, frequency around 125 kilohertz and little to no energy below 100. Like they just. Wow. Don't okay. That. Yeah. But through this study, they demonstrated that the heavy sized dolphins produce a second type of click with lower frequency and broader bandwidth in a frequency range that is audible to killer whales. Hmm. Okay. So uh, it's most likely that the benefits of these clicks is to decrease, decrease transmission directivity, right? The narrowband high frequency is like, you can only hear it if you're right in front of it, right? If it's wider range, it can go a, a wider array. It's spread farther. Spread farther so more people can hear it or more uh, dolphins. 
and increase conspecific communication range. So you're increasing who you can talk to within that range. But the okay. bad side is that the orcas can also hear you too. Hmm. Um, so the dual click strategy therefore allows these social dolphins to maintain acoustic, acoustic crypsis during navigation and foraging and to selectively relax their crypsis to facilitate communication with conspecific. That is super cool. Isn't that neat? It makes a lot of sense, right? Where like you'd have you'd have these different techniques and strategies depending on what your activity is. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's why I think awesome. like this is very similar to, again to porpoises, where like they have these, but they're also social. So like we need to know more about the vocalizations because we know that porpoises can, I think, go lower than um, um, than what they were saying here for these guys. But it makes sense that they're you're going to have thing do things for different times and mm -hmm. be able to relax that if um, if if needed to better communication. Right? Because mm -hmm. um, if you're yelling in one direction, nobody's hearing you. You're wasting your time <laughs> talking to your friends. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I thought that was really, really super cool. Just showing mm -hmm. that they can actually do that. So along that, Martin et al. 2019, following this paper, then published another paper, um, to buzz or burst pulse, the functional role of vocalizations. So they re uh, looked at the relationship between buzzing, so echolocation buzzing, the clicks for, for finding food, and then burst pulse signals. And burst pulse signals, just for a brief recap, are these weird things that's like a whistle and a butt and a click combined. And yeah. they're really hard to, to research and understand what the heck is going on because they're just this weird hybrid. Um, but burst pulses, um, I, we know, I know from my dolphin work in the Bahamas, are very common in social communication. Like they use those a lot in that kind of communication thing. Uh, and so they looked at the relationship between the echolocation buzzing and the burst pulse signals in both surface behavior, um, foraging, interacting with the kayak and socializing and group size. And they found that burst pulses were strongly linked to socializing behavior and occurred more often and more frequently during socializing and much less during foraging, which makes sense mm. if, as we see with other dolphins, that's when they use them. Buzz vocalizations were not strongly linked to a specific behavior, although there was some evidence of an increase in production during foraging and socializing. So hmm. buzzing seems to be kind of all around thing and burst pulses are, are more just for communication. Got it. And they had individual level production rates of buzzing during foraging, um, in the individual level production rates of buzzes during foraging and socializing and burst pulses during socializing decreased with increasing group size. So they basically talked less as their group size increased. Which makes sense, right? It's kind of like that, you know, you'd have to direct your communication because there's just more noise in general. True, yeah. But I mean, it seems like they're talking less though. Hmm, interesting. So, so as the group size increased, they're talking less. Yeah, the production rates huh. of buzzes decreased and burst pulses decreased. Interesting. So it gives them maybe they don't have to because you're in... You're right, you're in proximity. Country, so you're just like, yeah, hey, I can see you. Then I need visual as well. So yeah. Huh. Very curious. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, they found they they had a temporally patterned burst pulse signals um, that often, so they basically, they occurred um, within a series of burst pulses and were directly linked to specific events such as aerial leaping, back flipping, tail slapping, and potential mating. So huh. there's particular things. So again, it's communication like, hey, I want to mate with you or hey, I'm having fun or, you know, whatever. There's a specific reason why they're using it. Um, and so this leads to the fact that there's more complex communication system based on, pulse pul on these pulse vocalizations than previously understood and perhaps driven by the need to facilitate the social interactions of the species. So again, hmm. more social than like, like I think we're going to find with porpoises. There's more social socialness to them than... right previously understood so interesting yeah it's really fascinating huh. um, cool. um i'm trying to figure which one i want to do there's two i have left and i think i'm going to do this one next because this one still is uh, acoustic related so gridley et al in 2020 used a toad passive acoustic monitoring to complement visual surveys um and so they again was in the namib Namibian Islands Marine Protected Area, that same place that well, all the other studies that I have here are from. And um, they did uh, dedicated visual and acoustic line transect surveys. Um, the acoustic methods provided data in offshore areas and during overnight periods where you couldn't do visuals or less easy. Um, but they were imperfect and not suitable for the ecologically important shallow coastal areas. Oh, too much noise. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, background so it's too noise. Too much like background, like things popping off and whatever, and they couldn't do it. So 
was very interesting that they demonstrated the utility of the passive acoustic monitoring in those surveys, um, but it shows that both the visual and acoustic methods are needed to actually collect thorough um, data throughout the range, right? You can you can only, visuals you could use both places, but acoustic you could only use really on the offshore. Um, yeah. So I thought that was very interesting, taking into consideration the, the ecology of the area, certain types of research are just not gonna be as well suited. Yeah, coastal coastal's hard because you have those crashing waves and the waves heading up rocks and there's a lot of background noise. Yeah, so if you're using just that, then you're going to be like, oh, they're, they're not really around in the near coastal, but like, uh, yeah, they are. Yeah. So it's yeah. good to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Though a good, uh, important reminder to um, that, that that plays uh, plays into what um, you can do um, research-wise. So the last one I have is on back to that population. Um, size. So this is Gopal et al. 2019. This is genetics and geographic variation with mitochondrial DNA. So that's the stuff you get from your mom. Um, so they did a 395 biopsy skin samples that were analyzed, collecting from free-ranging heavy side dolphins in seven locations between Table Bay and Walvis Bay, Nam Namibia. Um, so south between South Africa and Namibia. Yeah. They used multiple genetic markers, which is important, uh, and a wide geographic coverage uh, and reasonably large sample sizes. So this is where I was saying that first study that showed it was just one population had small sample sizes. This was, you know, almost 400 animals from a wide, oh, wow. okay. yeah. And including both South Africa and Namibia, which are the two places we were talking about before with the with the abundance estimates. So all of the analysis rejected the, the hypothesis that there was one homogeneous population. So that's oh, basically like, interesting. not true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as with these dolphins are, but revealed contrasting results in the genetic structuring of the potential smaller populations within that. <laughs> so they're like, it's definitely not one, but not sure what it is underneath them. So Interesting. what it suggested is that there, there are two populations, either two populations or a fine scale subdivision of with, with six kind of subpopulations. Mm. Um, the microsatellite markers that they used were indicative of two widespread populations with measurable gene flow between them. Okay. So basically the overall thing of the study was that there appears to be two primary populations, a Northern and a Southern, but within each there is some limited structure, unknown how much, um, and suggesting that the gene flow is not entirely ubiquitous between the sites. So again, those patchy distribution, there is some gene flow, how much gene flow between those and how much that leads it to be genetically different is still kind of unknown, except for hmm. a northern and southern sections. But I think so. What I'm genetics in between, right? So what I'm visualizing is like an hourglass shape, where it's like you have the primary population up here in the north, and the primary population in the south. But then you have this sort of like narrow area of mixing potentially that might still be happening. Is that correct? Yeah. So I think if, if we're just looking at the two populations, that's a good visual. Yeah. Okay. But. They're still unsure. They're, the other one was like could have six subpopulations within it, so it could be this right. So depending on how fine models, scale, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and that. But you still have that one major hourglass thing in the middle where there definitely are those two populations. What in between those is you know different. And this would be interesting to look at mm. like, from photo ID, you know, and the individuals. Like how does that match up with the genetics? And there could be socially distinct groups rather than mm. genetically distinct groups. You know, right. Um, so again, it goes to that one one way of research is not the best way to to look at something. We, we, it's good to look at multiples because genetics are not going to show you social and social is not going to show you genetics. Yeah. Um, and all of those things feed into one another in terms exactly. of distinguishing yeah. what is actually a population versus not. Exactly. Because if you're socially you know, restricted to the small thing, eventually over time, you may become genetically distinct from another group because you're not interacting with them as much. Yeah. Um, and then wow, how, what so those, interesting. I know, right? So the, again, they are, I think it's a good one to end on because it's like, we have some clarity along with more confusion. <laughs> <laughs> They're very enigmatic. They're very yes. enigmatic species. They are. They are for sure. Cool. So, All yeah, right. so that's the um, really cool, but confusing species of heavy side cell phones. So for the, our last few things, what are the fun, I know we're going to get to the names because I'm excited. The names are I yeah. tried to stay away from the names, but I did see one thing about it. So I Okay. So the main thing I have to share about the names is really just the, where their name came from. So these guys were originally discovered off the coast of South Africa by Captain Haviside, <laughs> H-A-V-I-S-I-D-E. And so are sometimes known as that original intended name, which is Haviside's dolphins. So they were originally intended to be called Haviside's dolphins. So However, 
I do too. I know. I'm like, I kind of want to just call them Havisides dolphins because yeah. this poor dude who actually discovered them, basically a case of mistaken identity resulted in them being named after a different captain, Mr. John Heaviside instead. So they got the captain names muddled up and he got the clar- he got the, the name and the other guy didn't. Yeah, and it's, it, it, I mean, it sucks because their names are really close, so I can see how I know, that's yeah. happening, but like... You'd think because they're really close, once they realized it was the wrong name, they would have like just changed it, it back. Right. <laughs> so Runners. they are they are sometimes still known as Havisides dolphins. I think it depends who you're talking to. Yeah. Um, and then they have another, uh, another couple of fun common names. So they are also known as Springers, Jumpers, or Squid Hounds. And we were trying to figure out We've we had another animal that we did on Rain Mammal Highlights recently that was also known as squid hounds, and I can't remember which one it was. It might have been another Cephalorhynchus. I think it was. Mm-hmm. I'll have to go back and check. Yeah. Anyway, so that was but kind yeah, of a fun little common also, name. So which I find is like they're squid hounds, but they like everybody's like they eat hay. Like, I know, and eat. that's where I was it's curious about that one. List. Yeah, where I'm like, huh, that's very interesting that they weren't like that wasn't one of their, their primary prey. Maybe there was like one subpopulation that like that's what they eat and that's what they saw. Like who knows? Or maybe it was just one maybe. person that did that and maybe. then that, that name stuck because they're like yeah, squid hounds and everybody's like that's cool. one porpoise. Yeah, <laughs> or one 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 dolphin rather. I keep calling dolphins porpoises. Well, because these guys, I swear <laughs> to God, these are like hybrids. These are like the the, the, the missing link between dolphins and porpoises. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so those are the those are the fun facts that I wanted to just pop out really quick because they're really fun. Yeah. No, I, I saw that too. I was like, oh, poor, poor Havisite. I know. Poor He's Captain Havisite. Yeah. He's doing good things and <laughs> got tossed to the side. Um, but anyway, all right. So that's very cool. There, these guys are very interesting. I'm excited to see, you know, a lot of the research really um, you know, sometimes when I do the new research, it's you know, 2015, 20, you know, early, late 2000s. These were all like 2019, 2020. Like, so I think there is more yeah. research being done on these guys. So they're super exciting to see what they find out because um, it does seem to be a very interesting species um, with some confusing stuff. So I'm excited to learn more about them as more research is done. So um, with that, we will let you go. Uh, next week will be a, a general review or a discussion topic of choice. Again, if you have anything you want us to talk about, please let us know in our social medias or through our email. Um, So uh, we'd love to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Otherwise we'll find something for you guys to talk talk about. Um, Also don't forget to go to our website and check out our merch. Um, This is our, our, I'm gonna say this now, this is our 10 year anniversary this year. So October will be 10 years old. So be on the lookout for our social media where we're gonna uh, start promoting that. And we will eventually have some new merch that has special 10 year anniversary stuff going on. So yeah, which is only gonna be probably available for a short period of time. That'll be a a sort of an exclusive launch. Yeah, exactly. So that'll probably be closer to the fall, probably like September, October um, for that. So keep an eye out. Um, So we're really excited about that. Um, And other than that, just uh, spread the word and donate if you can. That's what all this, uh, any donations and and merchandise sales always go to back to the research and providing things like this for you guys. So um, thank you all for the support, whether you're listening, sharing or donating, it's all greatly appreciated. Um, And with that, we will talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>